So, hey, hey everybody. Um, I'd love to introduce the Lawrence Berkeley team, uh, Jean Lefebvre, Jean Remy Leahy, and Alex Hugo. Uh, and they've been doing a lot of awesome work on uh, large scale simulations of simulators using particle and cell codes. Yeah, welcome. All right. Welcome, everyone, and thanks for having us today. All right. So, I'll start with introducing uh, us a little bit, uh, where we come from. So, we're at Berkeley Lab uh, that was founded by Lawrence in 31 of the Rad Lab became. Uh, Berkeley Lab and is known, you know, for having pioneered team science and also big science uh, at the lab. It was very successful. You see this picture from 38 now on top of this magnet of 60 inch cyclotron. Cyclotron is a type of particle accelerator that Lawrence invented. And in addition to Lawrence, who got the Nobel 39 for this invention, you see two of the Nobel laureates, Bruce and Morris, uh, and Edwin Macmillan, who got, got it in 51, 68. And also, someone didn't get a Nobel Prize, but it's kind of well-known Robert uh, Oppenheimer here at the top. Um, and that lab has grown quite a bit, and now it's not just particle accelerators. It uh, has six areas, like biosciences, computing sciences, earth and under, uh, environmental sciences, energy sciences, energy technologies, and the uh, uh, area that we are in, which is the physical sciences. And now uh, division is the accelerator technology and applied division. So uh, accelerator technology applied division, or ETAP, uh, has a number of groups. I will not go through them all. And our group that we are uh, presenting uh, the work uh, of today is the accelerator modeling uh, program. So accelerator modeling program, of course, models acceler ac uh, particle accelerators, but not only. It also models plasmas, beams uh, of particles, as well as lasers the interactions together and with materials, and we do also fusion reactor uh, science modeling. Um, so the AMP program offers a broad range of computational tools and uh, tools and expertise. You see the team here, seven staff. We have four postdocs now and, and four students at the moment. We are a multidisciplinary team uh, uh, and a uh, range of activities with applied math physics, software engineering, programming, machine learning. So basically, we do everything from the fundamental equation, discretization, the algorithm, the analysis, the programming of them, then the simulation, and so on. So there's a broad range of physics and application that are modeled in the code. And, and uh, Axel will tell you more about the beam plasma and accelerator simulation toolkit that we maintain. Uh, one of our originalities that we uh, also develop algorithms, and we have a number of original algorithms. That will not be the focus of the talk, but it's one of the very important uh, activity of us. And we're also leading multi-institutional projects across the Department of Energy. So the outline of the talk after this uh, introduction of who we are uh, is uh, I'll give a short intro on particle accelerator modeling. Clemmy will talk about the particle intel uh, algorithm. Then Axel will uh, talk about developing massively for uh, our peak codes. And Remy will take over to uh, talk about the role of uh, machine learning. So particle accelerators, I think that everyone has at least heard about them uh, in the context of uh, discovery science, the big ones for particle physics. But they also use heavily in, in, every, uh, in many aspects of modern life. So many uh, accelerators are used in medicines, like up to uh, maybe now 10,000 medical accelerators. Uh, tens of thousands of accelerators in the uh, industry, and also they can be used for national security to do some inspection uh, inside cargo, for example. Uh, there are many types of particle accelerators, and we'll discuss only quickly two types here that are the most uh, uh, common, or at least the, the most high-performance ones. So one is the cyclotrons, like the very big one at CERN in Switzerland and France, the Large Hadron Collider which has a, a circumference of 27 kilometers, which basically uh, reuses radio frequency cavity to accelerate the beam each time it passes through. And it has big magnets all around to uh, have a circular trajectory of the charged particle beams and a few interaction areas where the particle beam collides. So obviously, main advantage of circular accelerators is that you can reuse the cavity again and again. Okay, to accelerate further. Disadvantage is particles that lose energy through radiation as they move around, and uh, so they are not suited for, for every application. So, alternatively, you can have linear accelerator where uh, now you uh, have a beam that enters one end 
and you have the uh, electric field that uh, oscillates at a given frequency so that it's always accelerating wherever the beam goes between cavities and it has basically advantages and disadvantages compared to the other one but they, uh, one thing they share in common that can be very big because one is at uh, Stanford and is about two miles long. So uh, the accelerating field in conventional accelerator is limited and that's both the reason for them being so big because uh, you need to have many cavities, you know, and, and large size to accelerate uh, to a given high energy. So the limitation of, that these so-called conventional accelerators that we just discussed is that it's due to the fact that they involve a metallic pipe with vacuum inside. And if you have a large electric field, we try to have as large as we can uh, inside a metallic pipe, then eventually you extract electrons from one end of the pipe and then you have some breakdown and that, that leads to uh, uh, issues of several kinds. So possible solution to reach higher accelerating fields and thus more compact, more powerful, uh, more efficient accelerators is to use uh, plasma. Uh, um, so in plasma uh, accelerators, a driver beam generates an accelerating wave. So what, the, the, what it looks like, basically, you will have what's called a driver, uh, so laser poles that enters a plasma column, and at the exit, it will have accelerated an electron beam. So you see here a picture from a simulation where you see the, the laser poles that is propagating in the plasma. So the plasma is a collection of protons and electrons. It's a gas that has been ionized, basically. And uh, the laser does not perturb the proton much, but it pushes the electron aside, OK? Uh, and the electrons then still, uh, you, you have the protons that stay unperturbed in the middle. So the protons that are positive create a, you know, a field that attract the electron back and you have this formation of the bubble here and the electron cross eventually at the back and uh, if you put now electrons you know that are these yellow particles they will fill an electric field that comes again by the, the combination of the electrons and the protons that are separated especially that accelerate them okay and this all move close to the speed i mean to the, it goes to the speed of the laser in the plasma, which is a little below the, the speed of light. But the electric field that you get here is orders of magnitude stronger than what you have in, in, in uh, conventional non accelerators. So the, the hope is that if you see here, for example, the SACL accelerator in Japan to accelerate to 8 uh, giga electron volts, you need about 500 meter of radio frequency cavities. Uh, if you see now the world record here at Berkeley at the Beta Center, with plasma accelerators, then it uh, accelerates uh, HEV over 20 centimeters of plasma. Looks very promising. The, however, <laughs> the catch there is that plasma accelerator is still largely at the research stage because we need to do improvement in beam quality, shot to shot stability, energy efficiency to catch up on the basically where they are on the conventional accelerator. But it's, it's, it's a fast passing technology, so very promising. So, for this, we need a lot of simulation, and I'll take uh, Remy uh, take over here to tell you more about this. So, question: so, uh, th This yeah. seems oh, yeah, core sure. to the uh, with the problem you're about to do. So, as I just understood it, you have a linear accelerator. You have an electric, you know, a metal plate, a metal plate. You you turn on the uh, what's called electromagnet. The particles pass. You turn a, you turn on the next electromagnet. Particles pass. You turn on the next electromagnet. That's how it normally yeah, works, that, right? That, that that's yeah schematically yes that's right okay and if it's a circular then you will do, do the same thing but now they're passing by the same thing yeah, over and over you reuse you reuse yeah. yeah that's right and here with plasma ones as i got it was um you have one second, you have a big soup of protons and electrons you at a high frequency push electrons out of the way and i guess they come back and out of the way and back and out of the way and back so you create these electromagnets where you have this void where you have a charged you know more protons fewer electrons or maybe the other way around if you push them somewhere else uh and you can just say void no void void no void and every half time you have a void you have you create a magnetic field is that roughly right yeah well right with 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 maybe uh, uh one caveat which is that actually you stay when you say void no void you have this void which actually propagates just like a boat on water that creates a wake right you create bubbles you Exactly. And so okay. this 
propagate at the speed of light. So if your electrons go also close to the speed of light, they can stay in, in the first, what we call bucket of you have this electric field that just propagate forward, right? Oh, wait. So I was imagining yeah. the path of electro, the path of your particles, laser pushing this way. No, no, no. It's the same way. So you have a moving bubble exactly. that your particles sit right. inside of, but right. it has to be like right. a speed of light kind of punch. That's right. That's right. I should have put a, yeah, I should have, I don't know if we have a movie later that shows that. But, uh, that that helps a lot. Movie. Yeah, but it's basically, it's as if you were here looking at uh, something with a, a moving window, something that follows the laser and it stays less, that, like that, more or less for the length of the plasma column here. And you ah, have the okay. So, the, that, uh, I, okay. I so this basically, the basically you will see that. It's one bubble. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, exactly. and that bubble, as I'm now getting, it, maintains the magnetic field because that gradient between the the more protons in the bubble uh yeah. more electrons outside the bubble that property stays through the right. entire process oh does the bubble right. so the particles inside the bubble accelerate does the bubble accelerate too because it has to keep up with the particles yeah so okay that's, that's an excellent point because actually since you accelerate the electrons eventually they go faster you know mm -hmm. and so this is what we call slippage Eventually, the electron beam will overtake the laser, so that's why this column will have a finite length. And eventually, you need to stage them. You need to have a new plasma column with a new laser. You know, at a later like point in the stage. And yeah, exactly. Okay. You now I'm getting the dynamics. You're going to be uh, simulating. Good. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'll stop sharing now, and then uh, let me uh, go ahead for the yeah, for the next. I'll, I'll try to share uh, just a second. Can you see my screen? Yeah. OK, sounds good. Yeah, so I'll talk about the particle in cell algorithm, which is the numerical algorithm that captures the physics that Jean-Luc just um, described. So what's the kind of physics that we need to capture? We need to capture the interaction between uh, electromagnetic fields and uh, particles or charged particles. So for instance, in the case of conventional accelerators, the charged particles are the particles of the accelerated beam. And the electromagnetic fields are, um, so there's two types. There's the fields produced by the radio frequency cavities. So this sort of, uh, um, the cavity produces an electric field that's accelerating for the beam. And then the beam itself has also electromagnetic field associated with it. Because if you think about it, the beam is made of particles that are charged and they're all of the same charge. So for instance, it would be a beam of electrons. They're, they all have negative charge. Uh, and so particles of the cha same charge repel each other. They repel each other by producing an electric field and then feeling uh, the force associated with this electric field. So this is what I represented here. This blue blue dots represent the particles of the of the accelerated beam. Uh, it's going, let's say, to the right, and then these arrows represent the electric field that they produce and then that they feel and that sort of repel the particles from each other. So we need to capture those fields and how they interact with the particles, how particles create those fields and how they feel the force associated with these fields. And then in the case of plasma-based accelerators, the charged particles are, again, the particles of the accelerated beam. So it's the yellow particles here. And then also the electrons and ions of the background plasma um, that are represented in blue here. And then again, there are electromagnetic fields. The laser pulse itself which drives the bubble. The laser pulse is also an electromagnetic field. If you know, if you're familiar with the physics of uh, lasers, you will know that they're an electromagnetic wave. So they're, they're an oscillating uh, electric and magnetic field that propagates in space. Then there's the fields in the plasma wake. So the, um, as Jean-Luc said, there's a, a difference between the number of ions uh, or protons and electrons here. And so that creates electromagnetic fields. And then again, there's the repulsive field, field uh, within the beam. Uh, and so again, we need to capture all of those fields and their interaction with the charged particles. Um, and so this is what the particle and cell uh, algorithm tries to do. Uh, in the particle and cell algorithm, we represent the electric and magnetic fields on a grid, which is represented in, in red here. Uh, and then the beam and plasma particles are represented by discrete particles represented in blue here that move through the grid. Uh, and then what the algorithm does, it computes the time evolution of the system. Uh, so in the case of laser plasma acceleration, for instance, it would be, it computes the evolution of the system as the laser is propagating through the plasma column. Uh, and so in this algorithm, there's always a, an initial, initialization uh, step where we set up the problem 
and then we compute the time evolution of the system with discrete time steps. Um, and at each time step, we update the fields and the protocol. Uh, for the fields, we update them using the Maxwell equation. Again, if you've taken physics, you will know that the equations that give the time evolution of the electric and magnetic fields uh, are the Maxwell equations. They, they look like this. They're a standard uh, a partial differential equation. And then for the, the beam and plasma particles, we use the equations of motions. So, um, this is the force as you did with the electric and magnetic fields and tells you how the momentum and position of the particles uh, evolve. And it's important to use the relativistic, so the, the equation of motions that include relativity in particular, because we're gonna push those particles very close to the speed of light. So the equations of motion need to take into account the fact that particles cannot go faster than the speed of light. Um, and this is into, taken into account by this term here. Um, and, and so you'll you'll see that the, the, those two systems are um, interdependent because the particles create fields. They create fields because as they move, they create a small electrical currents. And so this this term that contains the density of electrical currents created by those charged particles. And so that feeds into the time evolution of the fields. And then the fields feel, feed into the motion of the particle through that force that contains the electric and magnetic field. So we really have to uh, evolve them together. And so the particle actually the, uh, the particle and cell algorithm does this by using this uh, loop. So at each time step, we're going to do those four operations. Uh, the first operation is that we're going to gather the, the electric and magnetic fields that are known on this red grid. Uh, we're going to gather them on the position of each of the particles. So each of the particle will do some interpolation to know the value of the electric field at their position and magnetic field. Then we'll use those fields to update the position and momentum of the particle using the equations of motion. And then once the particle have been updated, we compute the charge and current density on the grid. So this term J that I was pointing to in the Maxwell equation, we need to know it's on the grid. So each particle will uh, contribute contribute to uh, their neighboring grid points. And then we use this J to, uh, to update the electric and magnetic field uh, using the Maxwell equations. So this is a, an algorithm that works very well, but it can be very computationally expensive. Uh, typically the number of computational operations scales like the number of grid points times the number of time steps. And the number of grid points is simply the, the volume of the, the system that, of the physical system that we're uh, simulating. So uh, the volume would be LX times LY times LZ, uh, divided by the volume of a single cell in the grid. So the, the cell size is DX, DY, DZ. Uh, and so in the case where we need to resolve sharp features in, in the wake, in this bubble, we typically need very fine cell size. So dx, dy, dz are very small. And so as a consequence, the number of grid points will be very large and that, that will be very expensive to compute. And then similarly, the number of time steps can be very large as well. So the number of time steps is typically the, the duration or the time of the interaction. So the duration, the physical duration that we want to simulate. Uh, for us, this would be the, the time it takes for the laser to propagate through a meter scale uh, column of plasma. Um, and then the time step uh, of the simulation is typically determined by the fastest phenomena. And in our case, this is the uh, electromagnetic, the oscillation of the electromagnetic field in the laser. So the laser is typically micron scale wavelength. So that corresponds to a very high frequency of oscillation of the electromagnetic field. And so we re that imposes a very small delta T. So similarly, this uh, ratio of the, the time that we need to simulate divided by this, the time step that we need to use can be very large. For, so for those different reasons, the, the computational cost of this algorithm can be very large. There's several ways to overcome this problem. One is to improve the algorithm. So come up with, um, fancier algorithm that uh, that beats the scaling in some way or, or another. So this includes using ge reduced geometry. So for instance, cylindrical geometry instead of a Cartesian geometry for the grid. Uh, mesh refinement, so focusing the resolution, like having finer cells around the features that are very sharp. Or using an optimal Lorentz frame. So that consists, instead of modeling um, this whole phenomenon in the frame of the laboratory or in the frame where we live, we, we use a different Lorentz frame um, where things are a little bit easier to compute. And so I, I, I won't, this talk won't talk too much about this algorithm uh, improvements. Instead, we'll focus on high performance computing, which is the other solution to 
to be able to carry out those very out, uh, those very expensive simulations, and that includes uh, using massively parallel code and uh, leveraging the power of GPUs. Um, and that's uh, Axel's part, so I'll stop sharing. And actually, maybe at, at this point, uh, just mm -hmm. to get a flavor for the, the this problem, it sounds like you're going to have a, a discrete mesh kind of mm -hmm. a thing for the fields. You're going to shove particles of what plasma and the accelerated particles into yeah. that mesh. Exactly. And now you have particles within the cell interacting, particles across cells interacting. Like, what's the interaction pattern? Yeah, so typically particles within the same cell don't interact very much. Okay. And it's more like in between cells. Yeah. So the, this this method carries the, the interaction in between cells. Ah, so let me get this straight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're assuming non-interacting particles within cell. Mm -hmm. Cell particles affect, I guess, the... The, the, the mesh state, which could be the corners or the center of the cell, however you did it. And then that thing affects the particles in the next cells. Exactly, exactly. So the particles create fields that are known on the grid, and then the fields on the grid affect the, the particles potentially in other cells. Okay, cool. And the other thing is, what is your space-time resolution? Because, yeah, it seems like micron for laser light is very small. Yeah, so typically, the, so the in the picture that Jean-Luc showed with the bubble, etc., we didn't talk about the scale. So this bubble is actually tens of microns of, of size. So, mm -hmm. you know, this plasma column that we, we showed like this very uh, thin filament of plasma. So this is hundreds of microns of radius mm -hmm. and then centimeters or meters of length. Mm -hmm. And then in that, you focus a laser pulse and you focus the laser pulse very, very tightly to a spot that's only tens of microns. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then this tightly laser produces this bubble, which is also tens of microns. Um, so that's sort of a, the, the scales. And then the laser wavelength is, uh, let's say, a micron. And then what's the time resolution to make this happen? Uh, so typically, uh, the time resolution is like the, the the space resolution divided by the speed of light because a lot of the phenomena yeah. move at the speed of light. Um, so uh, yeah, so it's usually femtoseconds, so ten to the minus fifteen. Okay, cool. Seconds. And then the, the next stage, we'll see how much that affects the to what extent you can, it's sequential to what extent this is parallel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thanks so much, Lamy. I'll then take over for the next section, which is on high performance computing and our development of massively parallel open source community particle and cell codes and how we approach this. So, in particular, what we develop here at Berkeley Lab and together with our collaborators, which we'll see in, in short, is the Beam Plasma and Accelerator Simulation Toolkit, or short BLAST. What BLAST is, is, is a suite of codes that you can see here, um, both grouped into general frameworks that we can use for poly accelerators. You saw already WarpX, another code is ImpactX, then specialized codes that we add on top of this. And in our software stack, we develop also libraries, standards, and utilities that we can share between these codes, and you will see the software stack in a bit. In particular, in this presentation, we will focus on our uh, flagship code here, which is WarpX which was supported over the last years in the DOE, so Department of Energy Exascale Computing Project, and was winner of the 2022 Golden Bell Prize at a supercomputing conference. And I'll show you these details next. If you're more interested in our software later on as well, it's all on GitHub. Um, I put the names of the GitHub organizations down here at the end of the slide. Um, and we, uh, you can feel free to catch up there if you like. Now, you saw so far our team here at Berkeley Lab, but this is not the whole story. We develop our source codes, uh, our codes and our libraries in the open, and we team up in particular with people both at the lab at different divisions. You see here the computational science division, but also other labs, um, both nationally, such as Livermore and Slack at Stanford. And we have contributors internationally from Europe, for example, CEA from France, we have collaborators at CERN, and by now, since we develop in the open, we also have contributions from industry uh, uh, from industry partners, specifically in the fusion startup space. Uh, many people are using our code already, including three companies here, and they also contribute their developments back, which are synergistic with our developments, and then we maintain them together. Now, let me give you an overview about how the WarpX party and cell code is structured and what it's solving. So we already saw the fundamental algorithms that we are solving, which is the particle and cell loop. And in particular, it's the electromagnetic particle and cell loop. That means we can take particles um, and they can move relativistically. They create currents like charged particles do. 
these currents might be delayed because um, fields can, or these, these currents create fields, electromagnetic fields, um, that then might be delayed to the movement of the particle since everything is limited by the speed of light. And all these retardation effects that come in with relativistic physics are self consistently modeled in the electromagnetic particle and cell loop. So, what we do is exactly this time and space resolution that we just discussed. We do an explicit forward iteration in time, and it goes around this loop that you see on the top left. So, we push particles that are charged, they deposit currents, so electromagnetic currents. They themselves then create B fields, B and E fields interact with each other um, for just from Maxwell's equations, from Ampere and Faraday's law. And then we gather these fields again and go to the next time step to push particles again. Now, this is the base algorithm. What we do is we develop on top of that new algorithms that we first yeah, invent literally and then implement on GPUs. So we have advanced algorithms like the boosted frame method that Remy mentioned. But one very unique thing as well is, is that we can do for the electromagnetic particle and cell loop also a mesh refinement method by resolving parts in a block structured implementation. Now, this is all Maxwell's equations. So this is relativistic uh, physics in electromagnetism. But on top of that, in plasmas, we want to resolve more physical effects. And for those, we implement multi-physics models, in particular things like ionization physics. That's basically a Monte Carlo method to implement um, uh, quantum physics. Then um, things like collisions inside cells. That's relevant if you go to high densities and particles start to interact even on the resolution of the cell. So we model this as well, but also things like high field effects, like quantum electromagnetic processes, like creating pairs from light. Um, these are things that we model with Monte Carlo steps inside this uh, part of the cell loop. For, for modeling our accelerators, we sometimes can assume efficient geometries. So of course, the world is really um, in, its, in its movement. So most of the time, when we have a general new scenario to explore, we have to do 3D modeling. But sometimes if your geometry allows it, for example, if everything is nearly cylindrical geomet uh, geometric, you can go into a quasi-cylindrical representation. And what we do is we have an implementation for that is basically at the cost of a couple of 2D simulations, but can solve uh, movement way more efficiently. And we can go lower, like proper planar 2D uh, geometry and 1D geometries as needed for quick exploration. Now, the interesting part for HPC comes here in the last three points. We implement this on multiple nodes so that we can go to the full size of supercomputers. And in fact, we are computing on the largest computers in the world as measured by the top 500. Um, we have to implement things like dynamic load balancing, which I'll show you a detail later on. And on these individual nodes, then we have nowadays multiple GPUs. So now we have, by now, we have like uh, supercomputers with up to eight or more GPUs per node. So these GPUs individually have to be programmed this we parallelly programmed, and we use different programming models, CUDA, HIP, and SICL to address those. And we can still compute on CPUs by using things like OpenMP. I'll show some details in, in a minute. And then to round it all up, since we are modeling uh, with input to output and data analysis, we have scalable I.O. that can actually then process um, and help us to analyze the data that we're producing by running on really large scale on supercomputers. Now, I mentioned already that we have GitHub repositories. We have a strong drive to develop openly with the community. So our codes that I'm presenting here, they all have uh, actively maintained and in lockstep developed documentations on read docs. We have an active uh, CI system that compiles and runs on every system we can, we can integrate automatically before code rests get merged. So we have hundreds, literally hundreds now of physics tests that run on every code change of our codes. And, um, and also the platforms that we target. And in order to deliver our whole software stack to our users and developers, we use extensively package managers um, to get them either on the development machine or on the HPC machines. And there are typical things from the Python space that you might know, like Conda and PIP. But then we also have to, uh, package managers like Spec um, that are not only useful for development machines, but can also be deployed behind firewalls on HPC machines. Um, for whole software stacks and build your build variants for different GPUs or CPUs, whatever your very specific HPC machine has provided. Now, let me talk a little bit about a challenge that we faced in the last two decades. Um, and unfortunately, this challenge started roughly when I joined HPC, so in the mid-2000s. So the challenge that we saw here is that if you look back over the microprocessor trends, so CPU trends and, and chip trends uh, over the last decades, we see that basically performance just came out by getting more and more frequency out of the same chips. So in the ideal case, you could really just say, take the same code, run it again five years later, and it's just 
significantly faster due to this exponential scaling here. Now there's a challenge that in mid 2000s this changed, and the reason for that is is that you basically could not pump more and more watts into a single chip, or the other way around, you could not get it out anymore in terms of heat, so you would start to melt the little surface you had for those. And the the response for that was the frequency were dropping, and with that at the same time you see this bump in single thread performance. It's not totally bumping the same way as frequencies because there are still things like vectorization that could be tricked upon, but in the end single thread performance just tanked. And so the industry trend changed in order to still deliver further uh, efficient uh, computing chips. And what happened is that we got a huge number of logical cores to compensate for that and to still keep growing in chip performance that we can use for computing. Now, this is what some people call then a Cambrian explosion of computing architectures, because in order to deliver these logical cores, you could either try to advance existing legacy architectures like x86 and try to get more out of this with more uh, intelligent protocols, but there are also other chips like Evolve of, of Power PC uh, architectures that continue to push. And then we had like ARM popping up over the last years, first from mobile space and also into HPC now. And then of course a huge variety now of three major dominating implementations of GPUs for compute, first with NVIDIA, AMD and Intel um, making the race here. And now the trick is for us, unfortunately, that all of these are not programmed the same way. Now, let me give an overview how the computer looks these days. So with these, if we go to an HPC machine, we might encounter any of these chips. And our problems are so big that we want to distribute them over computers that have multiple of these chips. So the first thing we do is we take our simulation domain on the, on the left and we distribute it over these tens of thousands of computers on a supercomputer. Luckily, for our problems, we can domain decompose them. That means we slice them up spatially and then have these little gray areas around them that are basically neighbor information that we have to exchange between every time step. And then we can ideally overlap compute and communication to a certain extent. But otherwise, these computers or these individual chips get their own problem. Now we have this decomposition here, and then we have inside those, effectively, if we multiply the number of cores in the GPU with tens of thousands of computers, you have up to millions of cores to compute and parallelize your problem on. So the loop that I showed you earlier. And we can do this in different ways, but specifically there are a few things that scale better. So you want to do a certain amount of tiling for CPUs and have vectorization on. But for GPUs, which are also vector machines, you want to tile in a different way rather than large blocks that are executed in parallel and where you want to feed hundreds of thousands of threads basically into efficient computation. So these are our two major architectures. But at the same time, we have to be aware that these things that are currently accelerating our computations in a node might be in the potential future be replaced or be complemented by other things like maybe FPGAs become coprocessors as well. And so we have to always be aware how can we program things so that we don't have to rewrite our whole code bases just because a new architecture is coming around. Um, so how Question. do we do? Yeah, go are, on. are the uh, ML focused uh, processing chips useful for your kinds of codes? I'm thinking they, they do things like matrix matrix multiplication, but only at 16 bit precision. So not quite what you want, but is it usable? Yeah, we, we explored this already quite a bit um, since they came out. The change initially was the precision is, was initially way too low. Um, that didn't help much. The recently and latest chips, they have support for at least for half position, uh, for single position and for sometimes for double position. That's helpful. The challenge that we have is that our operations that we showed in the parting in Salute, they are not dense uh, linear algebra. So mm -hmm. we usually have a lot of zeros in there and that makes it pretty challenging. Um, we found a couple of, right. we explored with both with gather and scatter operations, so specifically like the field gathering and also the current deposition parts, um, but there's too many zeros currently in there. And then other challenge that you have is you have to pack the data structures before going in and out, which adds another overhead. So you have to pack into the vector or the matrix format and pack, unpacking them again, which then is just at the brink of not make, be, making it worth it right now. And that's notably worse than for a GPU, which has some of the same flavor of challenges. Yeah, no, we, we only tried it with GPU, with GPU um, ML uh, uh, matrix operations. Yeah, matrix, matrix. So we didn't try it with specialized uh, chips. We looked into GPUs for now. Yeah. Got it. So then for implementing our, our actual physics routines, um, we have now this, this uh, huge set of hardware, and each of them, unfortunately, come with their own programming model. So there is not a one-to-one -one relation here. Um, some of them try to address multiple, but effectively, performance usually there is. 
So you have NVIDIA CUDA that only runs on NVIDIA CUDA hardware. Uh, you have Rock and Hip that runs only in AMD. Um, and you have Sigil that is primarily developed for Intel, but is also trying to spread out to other architectures quite successfully. Now, there is a difference here in the programming models. Some of them are ideally suited to C++, which we take uh, for our implementations, and others are more Pragma-based. So we focus more on the C++ abstractions um, that enable us to program directly in our language. Now, our software stack is basically now to come on down to this level of hardware is, uh, is developed as following. We have message passing, which is the inter-node communication. So from one GPU to another, from one node with four GPUs to another. We have in-node acceleration, where I will show you a detail on the next slide, which is the abstraction so that we only have to write out physics once, and then you can compile it at compile time to the right accelerate hardware. And then we add on the higher level things like containers and algorithms, so n-dimensional distributed fields, for example, and, and, uh, and then large data frames that are distributed over GPUs on a whole, whole cluster. Then we have mass libraries um, and I.O. libraries. On top of that only, we start implementing our physics modules, both in libraries and then in applications. And last but not least, we do for productivity, but also for binding, for example, to ML frameworks, we have a big layer of scripting and language bindings, specifically to Python, to exchange our data structures on GPU with other frameworks, and also being able to set up our simulations effectively and control them as they run, for example, by registering like observers and callback hooks. The implementation I want to show you one detail is the AMRX library that we use, because the AMRX library provides us with a couple of functionality. It's interesting for us. I showed you domain decomposition and specifically domain decomposition containers, as well as uh, load balancing routines and block structured mesh refinement are things that AMRX implements. It also implements a performance portability layer, which we will take a look on in the next slide. And it has nice uh, framework capabilities, like being able to implement it already, bindings to linear solvers or implementing their own linear solvers, for example, for initial conditions or for specific routines that we have, embedded boundaries when we cut through cells and things like runtime expressions. Now, how does the performance portability layer look like? The, when you implement CPUs or GPUs, you usually would go for CPU code and you would try to vectorize it. So either you use specific data structures, you use fixed size loops, you add annotations like Pragma Zimli and try to vectorize it, the small loops out efficiently. That's quite different from GPU code where you usually want to work on a block structured matter. For example, for CUDA code down here, you have a kernel that you go into and address an index space in 3D, which is then nested into each other. AMD is luckily similar with the HIP implementation, and then Intel with GPUs is again a different syntax. We do not have time to invent algorithms and then implement them in four or five different backends. That doesn't work for us. So what we go for is a performance portability layer that is uh, developed over the last years in AMRX, and there are community efforts to bring this into ISO C++ uh, with similar frameworks that are developed uh, with international partners. And what we do are constructs like a parallel four that then abstracts nesting and blocking away and then compiles the lambdas that we put into them. So this is the inner part here or the equal sign for, for example, CUDA, GPU, CPU, and, and SQL. Now, let me show how, how this works in practice. I want to Wait, show you one question. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah. So this looks very much like uh, OpenMP or many, many other things, you know, a, a parallel four with uh, Affinity. Yeah. Um, why not use any one of those or how are, is your use case different? Exactly. So the uh, the routines that we need is parallel four implementations, and potentially they are also hierarchically nested um, to have block uh, blocks. Uh, so blocking algorithms implemented, and all the things like shared memory addressed efficiently. Um, and uh, yeah, there's also parallel reducers. So basically, what you need is map reducers and maps. Um, these yeah, the developments that we show here, they started all the same time for C++. So there are a couple of libraries. MRX implements this. Cocos is another one. And now the Powell STL and the ISO C++ starts to develop this as well. Um, so they all started at the same time. And now it's going to be the time where they get standardized. And I would say they kind of converged mostly in the same direction, which is a good sign. Um, so yeah, they are, they are very similar. Yeah. OK, and this step is for on-node parallelism, or can you do it? It's on-node parallelism, yeah. We have also we also have like abstractions for doing like a reduce on node and then reducing it over nodes. So there's a yeah, similar abstraction if you want to do reduce me a scalar from 10 to 13 particles. Um, yeah. OK, that makes sense. Thanks. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. I want to show you a quick science case. And specifically, we, we, we put all the implementation for a cool science case into the supercomputer conference last year. And what we modeled here, the challenge is that we have a laser interacting with a solid target, um, which is super high density and needs more resolution. That's the great part. 
on the right picture. And we will see the left side is this orange part, black part. So we did a refinement patch around this part and ran this on the largest supercomputers in the world, and specifically the Frontier machine, which is the first exascale machine in the world that's reported. And it's also yeah the first time that we could get our hands on an exascale. So what we did is we refine a part of the simulation, and then we don't only need this for a short interaction period, and then we want to take particles from the surface and rip it apart and accelerate it further. So what you see here is putting all of this together in this video on the left. So you have this laser pulse bumping off the surface, ripping out electrons, injecting things into the bubble structure that you saw before, and then propagating to uh, yeah, just forward and forward. And so what we can do is we take we this large scale ability to even model this problem. We could never resolve it before having this machine. And we can take now the physical effect that we can take out so many electrons out to accelerate them to high charge because many particles, and then to real long length by moving this mesh refinement part slowly out as we don't need it anymore. So this is the physics case that we modeled. And the uh, um, we have more details in this paper. But the interesting part for HPC is the following in this slide. It's that we can stay efficient as we increase using more and more nodes. So on the following slide, I'll show you scalings from going to the full system side of over available nodes, which is going over five orders of magnitude in some cases. And it goes to the biggest machines in the world. Frontier is a GPU machine for AMD GPUs. Um, in Oak Ridge, Bugaku is the largest CPU machine on ARM CPUs in, in Japan. And Summit is a and Perlmutter and Vita GPU machines. And what you can see here is in the scaling is that when we increase the computing needs, so more resolution and linearly increase also the number of nodes that compute on that, we will stay pretty high to this ideal line. And that's exactly what we try to do. But at the same time, we can compute significantly larger problems. And so we can basically down, do now 500 times larger problems than we could do in 2019 when we start this problem. Now, there's another direction you can measure. It's what we call strong scaling. And what you do here is instead of de decomposing further and further a problem, you actually reduce the problem, uh, keep the problem constant, and just increase the number of computers that work on it. And this problem actually does only scale so far, so like one or two orders of magnitude, because at some point, if you just try to get your result faster and faster without giving more compute uh, to the devices, you will just underutilize the machine. Nonetheless, we just measure this here, and you can see we can still get up one or two orders of magnitude of speed up if you're willing to get a drop in efficiency at the end, which you always have to calculate when you do this. So strong scaling is not our primary motivation. It's weak scaling, bigger problems, and bigger, uh, bigger resolution. And with these bigger problems, we can solve really things like having high resolution, but also doing more physics in it, like doing 3D problems that we could only do in 2D before, resolving new effects in physics, adding new Monte Carlo effects that I mentioned, and so on. Now, in order to wrap up the HPC section, I think that we will slightly over time, I will, I will wrap this up with this last slide. I want to give you one selected challenge, because what I showed you so far with the composing over supercomputer was just a very simplified picture. So in reality, the plasma interaction, and here it's a laser pulse not shown, but interacting with a plasma target over time from left to right, you see this very intense uh, surfaces here, and you have like, okay, there has to be a lot of particles suddenly on this front surface going into the plasma. Somewhere else, there's no particle at all. This clearly creates an imbalance in computing need. And so what we do in reality is we do not create one box of domain decomposed section that we put on a supercomputer GPU, but we create actually the over decomposition of, let's say, four to 12 boxes that we put on one GPU. So we slice our problems up with a side over decomposition, as you see in this color full map here. And then we basically assign more work where there's less particles specifically to GPUs together. And if there's a lot of particles in one box, then we just give it to one GPU and let it crunch for its own. So what we did recently for this uh, for this study is we, as we, we, in order to create this mapping on the left-hand side, we need to estimate cost. And what we recently did is we did an estimate of cost specifically on GPUs and measured this um, in C2 as the simulation is running so we can update how many CPUs or GPUs are taking how many boxes. So updating the left-hand picture dynamically over time. And so what we found is a new way to measure this efficiently in C2, um, how the cost is uh, evolving as particles move and create these very violent structures. And what we were able to do with that is actually do simulations that would otherwise just run out of memory in the first place, because suddenly all particles end up on the same GPU and 10,000 GPUs wait for this one GPU. And at the same time, since we balance better, we can also be faster. And this is one thing that we measure this device side cost. With that, I will close the HPC section and we're going to end out. Can we? Do you want to take Let me ask one last yeah. thing here. Yeah, I will um, share my so, screen in the meantime. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you were uh, 
it, what you're doing is not like an AMR. It sounds like it's a hierarchical decomposition scheme where I, I didn't quite get how you make it friendly to GPUs and how do you make sure that it's actually properly distributed? Yeah, that's a great question. So the so our mesh refinement system or the uh, scheme is block structured mesh refinement. Mm -hmm. So effectively, you already have uh, blocks that you mainly compose on GPUs and you try to keep them relatively large. Inside these blocks, we have multiple fields, scalar, vector, tensor fields. These we basically have uh, already tiled and it's, that's, they're just multidimensional fields. The particle structures is the one that's more tricky. So particles for us are the, basically tables or data frames. So they are basically a structure of arrays. And in order to process them efficiently, we tile them further. So usually we do fixed size arrays for individual properties, collect them, them again in a struct, um, and then have multiple of them depending on how much particles move between one GPU and another. And how often do they end up moving? Oh, all the time. Okay. <laughs> they move. Depending on the algorithm, so that maybe particle cell code, they move one cell per time step max. But um, depending on variations that we do of the algorithm, they can also move multiple cells. But they won't go from the top left to the top right. So there's some right. locality that we can use. That we can use. Uh, yeah. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Yeah. I'll, I'll go to the next section. So um, the role of uh, machine learning. How can we use machine learning to improve our work workflows? So there's a lot of things that we could do with machine learning, but our group currently focuses on uh, surrogate models. By surrogate model, what we mean is a fast ML-based model that approximately reproduces the input-output relationship observed in simulation. So uh, what this means is if you give a given input to a simulation and get a certain output, then the surrogate model with the same input should produce an output that's, that's uh, very close to the one given by the simulation. And we have uh, these two workflows where we use surrogate models. The, they're different, they have different aims. Um, one is surrogate modeling. Uh, here the idea is to train a, a very accurate surrogate model using large amounts of simulation data. And then we, we can then use the surrogate model instead of the simulation in cases where speed matters. For instance, in real-time operation of, oper of accelerators, if we want to quickly have some prediction that the operator can use uh, while operating the accelerator. Uh, another workflow is surrogate-based optimization. Here, the aim is to explore a large parameter space. For instance, the parameter space of all, of all possible designs for a given accelerator. Um, and we explore this parameter space with simulations. And then we use a coarse surrogate model that was trained on a limited amount of, uh, of data, basically the, the simulation that were run up to now during this optimization. And then we use the surrogate model to suggest promising parameters to try next or to simulate next. So in the first workflow, uh, the surrogate model is, is the final product, whereas in the second workflow, surrogate, mo uh, surrogate-based optimization, the surrogate model is only a tool, and the final product is the optimization. Uh, so I'll first describe uh, surrogate modeling. Um, one typical use case for surrogate modeling in our case is when we model uh, an accelerator beamline. So an accelerator beamline is a, a collection of, uh, or collection of several accelerator elements and the beam is going through those different elements. So uh, for instance, an accelerator beam line would um, contain a plasma source that creates the, the beam of particle to be accelerated. Then there would be some transport sections, so typically devices that focus and condition the beam. And then maybe a plasma stage where the beam is accelerated, maybe another plasma stage where the beam is accelerated to higher energy. And then maybe a clicker magnet that would deliver the beam to some area where it can be used for applications. Uh, and so those different parts of an accelerator beamline are typically a model with different codes. So for instance, every time plasma are involved, we would typically use WarpX. For transport um, sections, we would use ImpactX. Uh, for the clicker magnets, we would, we would use the electrostatic version of WarpX. Um, and those different codes have different costs. So that's what the, the color uh, here represents red is a uh, very general code but very costly and uh, uh, green is very specialized code that can be very fast um, so ideally for start to end collider modeling so when modeling does accelerate the beamline and so re for real-time operation we would want all all those steps to be very fast so we would want uh, a, that within a well-defined parameter range we could replace the expensive plasma simulations with uh, pre-trained surrogate models. So the, 
you know, the, the aim is to have something like this, where all the expensive sections are represent, uh, replaced by an ML uh, surrogate model. So what 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 this uh, what would this ML surrogate model look like? So typically, what is important to us is how the beam evolves. So how the different particles of the accelerated beam uh, change, how their position and momenta change. Uh, and so the input to a surrogate model would be the positions and momenta of each of the particle of the incident beam. So it would be x, y, z, uh, p, x, p, y, p, z for the momenta uh, for each of the particle in the beam. So it's a very large co collection of those numbers. Um, and then, the, so this would be the input to the surrogate model and then the output would be the position and momenta. So the same quantities, but uh, at the end of the stage. So the position and momenta for the, the beam that has now been uh, accelerated. Uh, and what we use currently for that is a circuit model that is based on the fully connected neural network. Uh, it takes the input x, y, z, p, x, p, y, p, z, and returns the, the output x, y, z, p, x, p, y, p, z at, at the end of the stage. Uh, so using the technique, we, we can get pretty accurate results. So th these plots show uh, those diff those di so each dot is, represents one particle. And we're seeing different projections of this uh, six-dimensional phase space. So you can see x, y projections, uh, p, x, p, y, uh, p, x, x projections, etc. And the black dots are the uh, is the data from the simulation, and the red dot is the data uh, predicted by the circuit model. So you can see that even when you have like complicated correlations in the phase space, um, like here and here, the circuit model is still able to capture them. So question here. Yeah. Uh, you're, uh, I missed this. Are you doing individual time steps like before and after as your data set? Uh, so the simulation itself would be would be doing many, many time steps, but the surrogate model just takes the input and then gets the final output. So the aim is to avoid all of those time steps. Because this is compute. This okay, is so then do you have a way of guiding it to be more physical? Like, I, I guess what invariant is, like, if you do every time step, you sort of force it to do to be more physical mm -hmm. um, or conservation of energy or anything that you enforce constraints like that? Yeah, so we, yeah, here currently we're not enforcing this kind of constraint. The idea is we, we're gonna train the circuit model in a, um, a restricted range of parameters uh, where having enough data is probably enough and we don't need those constraints. Um, so yeah, that's the idea, but, but you're right, there, there are many, um, there are many works in, in the literature where they explicitly try to enforce certain constraints uh, by you know, having certain arch architectures in the neural network or um, yeah, using certain techniques. So that's, okay. that's definitely a field that's, that people are working on. Okay, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. The second workflow that I was going to talk about is circuit-based optimization. Um, so here the aim is to optimize a given design, so a given design for an accelerator. So for instance, for this uh, laser plasma accelerator, we have different design parameters, such as the value of the gas pressure inside this plasma filament, uh, the energy of the laser that we send in here, uh, the position uh, within this uh, plasma where we focus the laser pulse, uh, et cetera. So we need to choose the combination of those, those values so as to reach, so as to maximize a given objective. Uh, typically this would be, for instance, for us, the, the final energy of the electron beam that has been accelerated, or maybe some other quantity like the total number, like the charge, the total number of particle that made it through uh, this accelerator. So in, in mathematical terms, we're in a high dimensional parameter space. So we're working with vectors uh, of, high of high dimension, where for instance, uh, the first component of this vector would be the value of the laser energy. The second component would be the value of the gas density, etc. And we want to find the point in this high dimensional parameter space, such as this objective function f is maximized. So we want to find x best, such as f of x best is uh, maximal. And what's crucial is we want to do this with as few evaluations of F as possible, because one evaluation of F means running a very expensive particle and cell simulation of the laser going through this whole stage, and then at the end measuring the beam energy at the end of the simulation. So each, each evaluation of F is actually a very costly simulation. Um, and so surrogate model optimization tries to minimize the number of evaluations that you need to do in order to reach the maximum. 
the idea is to progressively learn the circuit model of the function that we're optimizing, so f of x, over the parameter space, and then use this model to only evaluate the most promising x. So we're, we're going to use this model to be very careful and only run simulations where we really think we're going to get uh, the best results. So this is how it would look like here. This is only a two-dimensional parameter space. Maybe there's two input parameters. Each of the red dots represent uh, simulations that have already been run. And then based on the results of the simulation, we build the surrogate model of the function f on this parameter space. So it's this blue color map. Uh, so for instance, here, we would predict that the, the value is very high here. And then we use this model to find the most promising point x0. It would be the point uh, for which the model has the highest expected value. So for instance, here in this dark blue region, or maybe also where the uncertainty of the model is very high. So maybe in this region where we don't have many points, the model predicts a value, but is maybe not very sure about this value. And so it might be promising to explore in this, in this area. And then we, this gives us a point x0, which is the most promising point to explore. Then we evaluate the objective function using an expansive simulation at this point. And then we add this point and the value that was obtained from the simulation to the data set. We update the circuit model, and then we continue uh, this, this iteration. Um, so it mm -hmm. sounds like initially yeah. you're running the real simulation, and after a while, you start using the surrogate model. Well, you never really use the surrogate model, because uh, in these works flow, you, you typically have very low amount of data, because that's what you're trying to minimize. We're trying to minimize the number of uh, evaluations. So we typically have low amount of da data, and the surrogate model is never going to be very accurate. But it's accurate enough to give suggestions of where the next simulation should be run. So in the ah. end, the ground truth is always the simulation. And the surrogate model is just here to advise and to tell you where you might be. It might be a good idea to run the simulation. So Does that make sense? It's a family of approaches where you learn uh, an approximate differential, uh, a differential by approximation. You use the gradient of the approximation, the approximate gradient, to guide you for the next sample. But no yeah. more. Yeah, um, yeah, that's correct. Except we don't exactly use the gradient of the model. We use something a little bit more, a little bit different. That's called an acquisition function. Uh, but yeah, the the idea is to to use this, get this model, and from this model, try to find the most promising point. And the, this concept of most promising point is vague, but there's a an exact mathematical definition using this so-called acquisition function. Do you have a problem? This is like an offline learning thing for reinforcement learning, where you learn your you pick your samples based on one version of the model, you keep advancing the model, you pick your samples based on advanced, so you, you bias your search. Do you have this bias thing where the yeah. quality of your, mo of your surrogate changes in complicated ways over time? Yeah, yeah, no, that's correct. Because, because you're only sampling where the model is going to tell you to sample, exactly. there's going to be some bias for sure. Uh, but because you're looking for the maximum and only the maximum, like the points where the function is maximum, and you don't care about the areas where the function is, is low, then this buy-in is, is actually not too bad. Okay. Because this bias will, will bias the model to, towards being very accurate, close to the maximum, not very accurate uh, elsewhere. But that's okay. fine for this purpose. There. All right, got it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the type of surrogate model optimization that we're using is called Bayesian optimization. And Bayesian optimization, the surrogate model is not a neural network. It's a, a model called the Gaussian process model. There's, there's a very good reference on Gaussian processes in, in this book. Um, the specificity of Gaussian process models, especially compared to neural networks, is that they return a prediction for f of x, and they return also the uncertainty of this prediction, which with the vanilla neural network, you don't get the uncertainty. But this, this Gaussian process model, they give you this uncertainty automatically. And that's important, because when I was say, uh, talking about the most promising point, I was saying this is where the value of f is large. But this can also be where the uncertainty of the model is large. So sometimes when the model is very uncertain about a certain area, it might be advantageous to, to explore there. And so having a model that returns the uncertainty is very crucial for that. Uh, and then also Gaussian, model, uh, Gaussian process model, they are well suited for small data sets. Uh, which is to say few evaluations of f. Uh, they don't scale very well for large data sets, but for small da data sets, they're very accurate. Um, and then the, so what we're actually doing uh, recently is multi-fidelity Bayesian optimization. The idea is we have this suite of codes that Axel and Jean-Luc described, the BLAST suite of codes. It includes several simulation codes with different levels of physics approximation. So some codes are very fast, but they make very strong physics assumptions, and some codes are uh, more general, more accurate, but, they, uh, but they're more costly. 
And so the idea of Bayesian optimization is to use a combination of those two types of codes. So use a fast, low fidelity code or fast, low fidelity simulation that makes strong physics approximation. And also use some simulations that are going to be costly and use the high fidelity code with fewer approximation. And use those two in combination to get to the maximum as fast as possible. Um, and so we use then uh, the circuit model called the multi-fidelity Gaussian process that can combine both sources of data, even they do, if they don't match exactly. So if the low fidelity code doesn't match quite the high fidelity code, but at least represents uh, reproduces the trends in the data, then this model, this uh, circuit model, can take advantage of this. We have an example here. It's only one-dimensional input where we have the objective function, and then we have data in blue from the low fidelity simulation, in red from the high fidelity simulation. So typically, we need we have more points for the low fidelity simulation because they're very cheap to run. So we have a lot of those blue points, but they don't match exactly the red points. But then this model, the Gaussian process model, is still able to take into account the the information here from the low fidelity data and make some prediction for what the high fidelity data would look like. And so you can see that this uncertainty that the model also predicts is very low here because of this low fidelity data that was used in this area. So we used this recently to optimize the beam quality in the laser plasma accelerator. Here you can see um, how the optimization um, uh, performs. So you can see the time, uh, the runtime of this optimization and uh, the best value of the objective that we found so far as this optimization proceeded. Uh, and so, of course, we want to find the maximum very fast, so that we mean we want the objective function to rise very quickly as a function of the compute runtime. And so, for a single fidelity, where we're using only one code, it rises at a certain speed. But then we showed that using this multi-fidelity approach, uh, you can find the objective a lot faster. Um, oh, sorry. And then now I'm coming to the conclusion and the outlook. So, research and development is on the way to develop more. Uh, powerful particle accelerators. Uh, they can have a large impact if successful. Uh, Jean-Luc showed these different areas where particle accelerators are used. And this relies a lot, this, this RD, RD re relies a lot on the HPC um, to make progress. And this brings exciting challenges in modeling that uh, Axel showed and, and scaling to cutting head uh, hardware, uh, using novel algorithms, AAML, as I was just talking about uh, before. Um, and then beyond particle accelerator, uh, large-scale particle in cell codes have other applications because, in general, they can model uh, interactions between charged particles and fields. So any type of plasma can be, in principle, modeled by particle in cell codes. And so two areas where we've been active recently are astrophysical plasmas. This models the plasma around the pulsar. And then plasma confinement device or, or fusion devices, um, which is also an area where, where we're growing uh, currently. So that's it. I'd like to thank uh, our sponsors, and if you have any additional questions, don't, don't hesitate. Well, fantastic. Thank you very much. It was extremely interesting. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye.